Hey everybody, I kind of, I know Anina and, it, and it's quite nice to, to meet the rest of you. We're going to be talking about wearables today. And this is very exciting for me because I started writing about wearable tech back in 2014. Um, and it was a space that I felt like the fashion industry just didn't understand and hence why I started writing about it. It was just for me to translate the obvious technical, amazing things that were happening in the space in a much more consumer friendly voice. So it's a space that I've been following for a while. Um, so let's start off with fitness trackers. This is something that I'm sure all of you um, have ever used or you, you've heard of like Fitbit and so forth. I would love to find out what you think in terms of how they are compared to smartwatches. Would you say smartwatches are taking over when it comes to fitness trackers? Or would you say that fitness trackers are still in the game and people are still seeking them out? Anyone wants to go first? Who's first? Who's first? <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll go first. Yeah, you know, like, I think that the thing about fitness trackers was, is that at the time, we didn't understand how many steps we were taking or how many calories we were burning. And so I felt like when they were initially introduced, they gave people a sense of the quantified self in the beginning of that process of like, oh, here's data here's information about me that I didn't know before. But at a certain point with my fitness tracker, I got to a point where I could estimate based off of my own activity levels, what my steps and calorie burn were. So they seem to have a little bit less significance or relevance in that space. I think that the stuff that's coming out now with like the stuff that like companies like Whoop are doing and you know, like sleep space where they're really looking at wearables from the point of view and fitness tracking from the point of view of like, how do you optimize your overall health, recovery time? I think that's the next level. And I think that people who care about that, especially in a performance space, are gonna to continue to use those fitness trackers. But I think for the general population, you know, I think they want more of a, a one size or, or, or one type of device that does a lot of the pieces that they want to accomplish. And a lot of the technology that they do, if, if, if you're wearing any type of smartwatch, it, it has that functionality built in plus additional. So I think that like for the specific markets, you know, fitness trackers are going to continue to grow. But I think that for the general market, other companies are embedding fitness tracking capabilities into their device. So it's going to be a ubiquitous experience at some point. I mean, I was excited when Joel Bowen came out with these fashionable type of fitness trackers. But I must admit, literally within six months, my fitness tracker was in my drawer. I kind of had <laughs> done it. And, and, I, and I think it's down to, you know, to do with the excitement. You're excited about all that information, all that data. But then, you know, if, unless you know what to do with it, or unless you're a kind of a person that's really into their fitness and really into training, it's just information that you kind of don't do anything with. I mean, do you agree with us? Do you think this is why um, a lot of consumers kind of gave up on buying fitness trackers and a lot of the companies ended up folding because of it? I would say that it's about real estate. So me personally, I do not like anything on my wrist. Whereas instead, I will more likely wear a ring. And so, for example, when we created our smart safety ring for women, the, the first iteration, a very important part of that was harnessing the step counter. And then later, you know, we thought about, you know, real estate on the app and also the, the type of value it could bring and, and having this step data didn't really make a lot of sense because yes, you could count it, but the question was is who would be wearing it at what time? And so having a ring, for example, I wear that all the time rather than a, a wrist watch. You know, I find that doing yoga, for example, bending my wrist and having something on my wrist is very, very painful. Uh, the, the watch slides around and, and that little knob always hits me in the, in the hand and it's very uncomfortable. Whereas if I have a ring on, um, you know, not only is the ring that we created like super fashionable, it's also um, something that you want to wear. So I think a lot also of the reason why people like shove that in the drawer was because they created something that was non-personalized uh, and, and was very much um, along the lines of, you know, I can make one mold 
And I need that mold and that thing to be as, you know, wide as possible. Basically what I'm saying is it had no fashion to it, right? So yes, the Apple Watch is more fashionable and more people wear it, but the question is really, do people want to have something on their wrist? I never have worn a wrist watch, you know? So would I then be more apt to just use that information in my phone? So that's sort of why we took it out of the ring because that information, that data was already in the phone. And you know, I get a notification on the phone of how many social media hours I, I do. Well, I also can get a notification on my phone for how many steps I take. So having it redundant in the app uh, was just sort of a duplication and I'd rather use that real estate for something else. So I think fashion, one reason why that thing ended up in the drawer. And then secondly, you know, it's already in your phone. Do you need it again, redundant in a wearable? Yeah, I tend to agree that the real estate, as uh, Anina said, is, uh, is, uh, is one of the key differentiators, but also price, you know, the smart bands in general are substantially more affordable than uh, the smartwatches. I mean, smartwatches, uh, you know, the good ones uh, end up being in the hundreds of dollars and you can now find, you know, very um, competitive and uh, very good quality uh, trackers for well below $100. Um, so uh, it's uh, we, you know we decided to go with uh, with a tracker because we are more health um, specific in our features and uh, body temperature and blood oxygenation these days <laughs> tend to be um, critical critical uh, data points uh, to potentially predict uh, risk of infection as an example. So uh, if we if we go out with devices that are in the four hundred dollar range, uh, many people simply cannot afford them. So we decided to go to go, you know, with a more minimalistic approach. Uh, and uh, as uh, as uh, you said before, you know, something that is less invasive and less uh, obtrusive, uh, depending on what a person does, like yoga, as an example, right? So, so we try to actually stay well below the one hundred dollar threshold, so that more people can afford it. Um, there is actually a Scripps Institute um, a research study that just came out that shows that heart rate spikes uh, combined with the blood oxygenation uh, reduction and uh, 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 a decrease in uh, sleep quality as well can be a predictor of, uh, of a COVID-19 infection as an example. So, so imagine actually getting this type of devices to collect all this uh, trend data and provide the person with some type of risk assessment, right? So. Uh, again, if we want to open up again, uh, we will need to think about these new features that go far beyond the traditional sports and fitness uh, uh, step counting scenarios, which quite frankly, I don't think uh, anyone uh, uh, sees any value in uh, at this point, given that most smart, you know, uh, most smartphones do, do a pretty good job at, at collecting those. So Debbie, do you think and that medical is going to be able to take that kind of like Fitbit and kind of introduce it more to unwell people rather than it being just the normal consumer, but maybe be more of somebody who is unwell and track their vitals and so forth. No, no, I think, I think, I think that each consumer from time to time, unfortunately, becomes a patient and then we all look forward to become a consumer again, right? So, so there is no threshold, there is no clear cut line between a patient and a consumer. So if we want to stay well, and we, if we want to actually, you know, uh, have uh, a uh, proper and mature approach to this, we want to make sure that we know where we are in terms of uh, crossing the threshold, right? Is my temperature spiking today? Is my blood oxygenation going down today? Is my heart rate spiking today? So if there is it, just the trend, not, not even the absolute value, if just the trend is moving in the wrong direction, then I should ask myself, should I get tested, right? So I'm, I'm a consumer still, I'm not a patient, but am I crossing the threshold or not, right? So. So that is, I think, what uh, will actually help opening up. Some of these devices will have um, NFC chips uh, in the band as well, so they can actually be used to open up uh, the, the, the door to our office, as an example, right? So we can actually correlate this type of data in an anonymized way and just let people in if uh, you know those parameters are under control, right? So you know, we were talking about airports before, we were talking about schools and offices, 
wouldn't it be nice to just have some type of automated model where we at least have a, a flag going out so that we know and we can personally make a decision whether we want to enter that area or not, right? So, so that's, that's really where we think uh, uh, this technology is going from a population health perspective more than the very sick. You're right, there is, there is an area for the, for the patient as well which is FDA regulated and so forth. But uh, I'm still talking about the, you know, the consumer before each one of us becomes a <laughs> Exactly. Yes. Yeah, the predictive, the, the artificial intelligence predictive analytics opportunities are just limitless on that. So what and also I think what's missing is, is the interoperability. For example, my friend, she ha as an insulin uh, patient and she has three devices that work together in a holistic way. She has the thing she sticks on her finger that tells the glucose levels, I believe. But then she has an app on the phone, which is a separate company. And she can take a picture using art artificial uh, intelligence and augmented reality. She can take a picture of the food she's eating. That app will calculate how much glucose that that meal will create in her body. And then she has a third device, which I don't know what that one looks like, that actually does like the injection. And then she can get like this shot right on the fly after eating. And basically what that all means is that she feels good all day, but it's three separate companies that are working together that have become interoperable to give her that experience of being able to regulate her glucose all the time, like in an automated yeah. way. And I just love that, that fact that, I mean, I think it's so impressive of what's happening in health that she can take a picture of her food. I mean, I wanna feel good all day. You know, I want the magic shot that makes me feel like superstar, right? And if I had, if I even I had to wear three wearables that would give me the magic shot to make me have that kind of good feeling all day, I'd do it. Because what do we want? We want to feel good, right? But again, it took three companies deciding to become interoperable and for the data that they're receiving to make sense. And then the end result is she gets the shot automatically at the right moment with the right amount of glucose and it's no guessing game. So I guess on a consumer level, also what Keith was saying was that what's missing is this doesn't, this data, fine, thank you for the chart and the pie chart and all of that, but what do you want me to do? We made a wearable that, um, you know, regulated the sun. Remember all those wearables for the sun? But then they just gave you a chart on the phone of how much sun. No, I don't want that. I want something that sets off a notification that says, yo, put some sun cream on. There has to be relevancy and the relevancy is missing. So, you know, I want to, want to talk about something before we move on to smart clothing. What are your thoughts on privacy? Because this is something that was a big conversation when it came to um, wearable devices. People were always asking, what's going on? How do I know you guys are not going to misuse my data? What do you do with my data? You know, um, what are your thoughts on that when it comes to privacy and wearable devices? I think we as technologists have great responsibility. Um, I found that working with multiple different companies, they didn't do the secure socket layers properly. They didn't, um, especially on Android phones, they didn't encrypt the folders properly. I had to like dig into the code and like ensure that they had, you know, 128 bit encryption on the right folder in the Android app at the lower level. Um, I think it's a very complicated thing that not a lot of people know. I'm sure Keith and Davide are doing it all properly, but I just find that a lot of startups don't really take it very seriously. And, uh, and then we have to think about um, forward thinking. I mean, most of these apps are making money by selling our data, which I think, again, as technologists, we have great responsibility and, and we don't do that, you know? So I think that, you know, there has to be some ethics in 
technologists, but sadly, I find it severely lacking. And I, I think that a lot of consumers would like the check boxes. We have them in our app of what can I share under which circumstances. And, uh, and that's just all lacking in general on the phone. Your phone is bleeding information about you. And, uh, and there's nothing consumers can do about it. So it's up to technologists to be ethical. So it's quite scary because I feel like yeah. it, it offers me this great device, but then says, but give me your firstborn before you <laughs> It feels like that, you know? I mean, am I wrong here? Am I being way too sensitive? What do you guys think? No, not at all. You know, like, I think that from my point of view, privacy is a human right. Um, you know, like, and it's something that, you know, like back in the day before we knew, we were willing to kind of, you know, sign all the contracts and because you because the experience is always you opt 100 percent in or you like get left on the side of society because you don't want to share your data right you know and most people didn't care about data so much back in the day and so we saw things like you know like you know the cambridge analytica scandals and like what you can do with that data and like how you can really like shift you know like human nature and like human culture and society dramatically by you know how you present that data how you use that data so i think now we're at a space where from my point of view ai is going to outsource a lot of physical labor robotics you know like ai is going to outsource a lot of knowledge work eventually you know like accountants doctoring lawyering you know like ai is already helping in those worlds and in those spaces dramatically so you know but what i think is i think a really good opportunity is is that like companies are making money off of people's data, but the people aren't making money off of their data. Now that kind of seems a little bit improper. You know, like what if we could use the money that people were gonna make from their data as an offset to all the technological job loss that's going to occur, right? And then now all of a sudden, like your value becomes the type of data that you generate and the companies that are willing to pay you for it. So I think that like, we can do a much better job from a point of view of, including the customer because at the end of the day the customer does not mind that i don't care that you know where my location is i care that you don't use it maliciously that you don't leak that information to someone else and i do expect that like if you're making money off of knowing where my location is some of that money should be coming to me because i'm the person who's here at the location so like i feel like we've left out the per the people who are using the services and treated them as goods and commodities and i think that if we treat them as partners from a point of view of tech and information one, you'll get a lot more valuable information. Two, you'll have a lot more societal buy-in to that information. And three, like there might be an offset that like might actually bridge some of the divides that were going to occur when, you know, massive, you know, shifts in the economy start happening because of like robotics and AI integration. I mean, I agree with you completely. I know there's a company called Lumia in New York that came up with a technology that gives um, consumers the option of what a company can get from them. For example, mm. you can know that I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm a female um, and that I am black, but that's all you will know. You don't know where I live. You don't. So I basically choose what they know and what the company gets back to me is let's say 20% off my next order. So you get something right. back. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that, I don't know what they've done with that technology, but I thought it was a really good way to kind of give consumers, um, you know, to trust the wearables that were coming out. Because I think it's that trust that's made the wearable market slightly decline to what it was, let's say, back in 2016, when people were super excited about it. And now I feel like it's kind of lost its baboon, you know. Um, but that being said, I do think smart clothing is, is kind of finding its feet and people are really getting into that. I mean, what do you think about smart clothing? Do you think it's got a, a strong future ahead of it? Well, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> we built our companies betting on that so yeah i think i think that's <laughs> that's uh that's that's why we think uh, you know the wearable wearable devices as we discussed before have uh, two types of uh, limitations one 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 most of them they're bound to the human wrist right which which is a which is an area that is very interesting for multiple reasons but is the wrong area for collecting other type of data, all right? So let me give you an example. Um, I believe we were talking about diabetic patients uh, a few minutes ago, right? And, and the fact that a type one diabetic patient needs three devices 
uh, to interoperate just to collect the blood glucose data, right? And, uh, and understanding the, uh, the, 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 the quantity of sugar <laughs> that, uh, that, uh, that each, uh, each of these patients is consuming every day, right? So, so imagine after, after a few years, that patient going through complications uh, most diabetic patients have complications like they lose eyesight uh, or they have problems with their feet. Uh, they develop uh, ulcerations. Um, just to give you an idea, there is an ulceration every 20 seconds uh, in the world. And, uh, and uh, there is an ulceration every 1.2 seconds just due to diabetes. Those are, you know, uh, horrible, horrible wounds that lead to amputations, right? So, so uh, you can't collect that type of data from the wrist. You need something on the foot to collect temperature data that can actually predict an infection, as an example. How do you do that from the wrist, right? So, so again, there are so many scenarios where uh, the technology, the wearable technology, need to disappear to the human eye into whatever we decide to wear in the morning, right? Uh, what we wear is an expression of who we are. So wouldn't it be nice for us as, a, as, as people to decide what type of data we want from each one of the pieces of garments that we, we wear. If I, am, if I am a diabetic patient, I probably want temperature on my foot. <laughs> That's because a, a delta of two degrees centigrade will actually be able to predict an infection. There is conclusive research on that. So, so, so that's why we think that uh, transparent computing, as we call it, is the future of wearables. The plastic and steel will disappear to the human eye into, into textiles and, uh, and, the sens yeah, and the sensors will collect the data. And I was just going to say that I think people want the technology to be invisible. So what yeah. you're saying, nobody yeah. wants to wear big, bulky stuff. Right. Some people just don't want to know. They don't even want to know they're wearing it. Right, exactly. Say. Right. Exactly. And they don't want the person in front of them to actually make that a part of the conversation, right? If I am a diabetic patient, do I really want to talk about my condition? I don't know. I, it should be my decision, not the decision of the person looking at me, right? So, uh, so again, uh, it's, it's uh, transparent computing is what we call it. So, yeah. I also would say that with the developments in um, graphene technology, so also why it has troubled this all these years to go into the garment is uh, as partly what Davide was saying before, the cost is so high because the minute you stick a battery in and then you have a microcontroller, the cost just shoots up. You know, there's there's no way to get it down to pennies on the garment right and and the same thing even putting one nfc chip at one cent per chip you know in a in a h&m type of situation it it's very difficult because that then by a million is a million dollars right that they have to spend on you know the the chips to go into the clothes so they're not willing to do that because it reduces their profit margins and their upfront costs. So if we start using graphene and we start printing the sensors in the garments, suddenly we can get down to the 00001% one cent on the clothing uh, you know, dollar. And that suddenly makes it into a mass manufacturing situation. But what we need then to come into play is we have to offload the harvesting into the smart home. So the way I see it is I'm working in the field of what role does clothing play in the smart home, smart city, smart office environment where I can offload the, the clothing basically is the sensor, right? Because we can print an antenna, print an antenna on the clothing, right? So we're we're not adding weight of a microcontroller. We don't need a box. We suddenly don't need all this crazy certification in the sense of batteries and power management and, and uh, all this type of stuff. Suddenly we're just printing ink on a garment that makes it into a sensor and an antenna. And then the smart home is receiving that data and the, doing the the number crunching or the cloud is it's passing it to the cloud is then doing the number crunching. So that makes sense in say like an elderly home, right? So say like some elderly persons are unable to control their bladder, right? And what if the garment, the undergarment they're wearing can sense the humidity 
And then that offloads and alerts the smart environment that, you know, someone has a need of help. They may not be able to say they need help. They may be embarrassed. They may just maybe not even aware of it due to dementia and other problems, right? But the smart home can sense that in the undergarment and an alert an attendant to go and then assist the person in a very smooth and respectful way, you know? And then the person, you know, gets a new undergarment and 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 feels better, right? Someone could be sitting for hours like that without alerting anyone. And so in, but you need a stable environment where the smart home is then connected up to everything. They can't be like walking off to the supermarket, et cetera, because then it won't be receiving data. But in, in a controlled environment like that, I think that's where we're going to see the first steps of that happening. And then as we, you know, fast forward into the future and, you know, have all the privacy stuff worked out, then we're going to see more and more of the smart city, smart home, smart everything, you know, come into play. I, I'd love to know what Keith and um, Davide think of that, but that's sort of my vision of it, that it gets offloaded into the smart home, the clothing becomes the sensors, this reduces the cost to a mass manufacturing level, and uh, also factories don't have to get any specialized new equipment. They can just have digital printers and stick new ink inside with graphene. Yeah, well, you know, it's, uh, that, that is very encouraging for sure. I mean, what we can do to reduce price using uh, ma innovative materials like graphene is very, very help helpful. Um, the challenge is uh, related to the fact that batteries, of course, are still, you know, one of the key components that uh, it's hard to replace, right? So uh, cannot be replaced just with, uh, with innovative materials. And, and, and innovation in, in battery technology has been very, let's say, slow. Uh, <laughs> the concept behind batteries still, the Alessandro Volta, you know, ba battery, battery concept. So, so anyway, um, we think that, uh, you know, uh, we need to modularize each one of these components and decouple the ones that, uh, are more expensive and can be reused. So the way we think about it is the sensors can be embedded in the textile and uh, the electronics and the battery can be connected to it. Uh, that's what we did with our smart socks as an example. The textile pressure sensors are embedded in the sock uh, and they don't burden the sock with the cost of the device. The device can be snapped to it and when I wash the sock, I just remove the device and, and wash the socks when, when the socks you know, are worn out, I throw away the socks, but I don't wear, I don't throw away the battery and, and the electronics, which has also an impact on, on the environment, right? So I can reuse that over and over again. So why should we just throw away everything, right? So, so by decoupling the electronics, the battery from the sensors, uh, which could be actually embedded in the garment, we, we think that we can actually modularize uh, the the uh, the architecture, and that's what we built in SDK. As a company, we cannot address. I mean, there are so many fantastic scenarios with smart garments, so that we we, we can actually enable other companies to actually create their own products, and and that's what we're doing uh, with a new brand new product with a very small startup, uh, actually led by a U.S. Army helicopter pilot, and that's going to be a baby product uh, specific to monitoring baby and. Uh, preventing, you know, the risk uh, and uh, <laughs> the related risk of SIDS, right? The sudden instant, instant death uh, syndrome for, for babies, right? So, so there are so many, so many cool things that we can do in this, uh, in this area. But again, I agree that we need to decouple the most expensive components, otherwise uh, that becomes, that becomes a, a, an issue uh, in adopting this type of technology, for sure. What do you think? Yeah, and I, I think my thoughts are like, I got into this world because um, I was trying to build a suit that would allow a person to download Kung Fu and the suit would teach them using vibrations. Um, and building that suit and, you know, especially attaching vibrating motors to soft clothing was such an experience of frustration and pain. <laughs> um, you know, like I, I, I couldn't put it any other way of how challenging it was to merge the soft and the hard. And, you know, like I have a background in like mechanical engineering, but I also have a background in fashion design. Like I was a handbag designer, engineer, and coach in Calvin Klein for a few years before I got into this industrial design world. Um, and so I was like, okay, 
technology, engineering, let's merge all these things together. And so where I think the very interesting thing about uh, smart clothing as a generality is, is that it does remove the technology from the person. At the end of the day, most people don't care how electricity works. They just care that when I need lights and I turn on this switch, it works. You know, and, and, and you know, that's, that's the extent of it. And I think that to the extent that we can allow, you know, like the interaction with the deeper technology to be an optional experience for people, not a mandatory one, I think that we're gonna have a lot more uh, um, adoption of smart clothing. And I think that like, from a point of view, I agree with the sensor. I love that concept actually. I've, I've never thought of that as the, the, as the closing just the sensors because I always saw the power source as being problematic. Uh, you know, like, like, yeah, the power source was always a problematic thing. And so it's like, especially since it's so hard and so physically hard, it goes against the grain of kind of like, how did the two move together? But one of the things I really do like is this concept that um, I like to start with applications first, you know, like, and I think that like when smart clothing and smart technology and smart textile solutions start to produce better results for people than their non-smart counterparts, I think that's when we're going to see a really, really dramatic shift. Like at, at WearWorks, we, we build a haptic wristband that helps guide people who are blind and navigate them using vibration. So, you know, like, but initially we, we just wanted to build a haptic band and we were like, hey, you know, like, let's let everyone else play with haptics because like there isn't really a haptic thing out there that people can just affordably grab and easily start playing with. But then we realized that most people didn't know what the word haptic meant, so they wouldn't know what to do with it. So we felt like we should build our own first application, Wayband for navigation, right? And now that we've gotten the creative juices stirring, we've had lots of people who have reached out to us for like Parkinson's, autism, um, you know, like the deaf blind, the deaf community. Um, so many different applications that we never ever thought of that now we feel like we can open it up. And so I feel that when people start to see some of the applications, cause you know, like, you know, Henry Ford's old quote, right? If I asked them what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. You know, it's like a lot of times people don't have the ability to envision the things that they can't see. And I think that like our goal as technologists really is to show those visions. You know, like, I feel like basically what we are is we're kind of like, fictional story writers that bring fiction into reality and you know like in the same way 1984 inspired a generation of like what surveillance state might look like so that we could pay attention and start to include those that thinking into our process because most people weren't really thinking that way before i think that new applications of the technology are going to open up doors that are going to make you know smart textiles eventually you know the necessary choice over what's currently available. So I think we have a ways to go before we get there. And a, and a, and a big part of that is really figuring out the hard to solve connection issue because it, it's it's really, really challenging. Um, and so I think there's a lot of material science work that definitely needs, that is in a process of being laid down that's gonna super support that growth in probably like the next like three to five years. I liked what you said, because I think I agree with you. Most of us didn't know we needed the iPad until Apple came up with the iPad. <laughs> You know, I think most of us wondered whether, why is it not ringing? Where's the phone option? Why can I not call with this thing? You know, so it was something where they looked at it and being like, okay, you guys don't really know you want this, but we've made something that will make your life easier. And it came up with this product, you know? And I don't think anyone, if they were asked if they wanted the iPad would have known exactly what it was. They probably would have wanted a better phone, right? Not, not an iPad. So I think you make a really good point there. But bringing it back to uh, battery technology, um, I kind of want to know what your thoughts are in terms of, you know, how wearable tech, um, you know, how we can deal with the fact that the battery technology is not advancing at the same pace as wearables. You know, uh, is there any hope or are we just at the beginning of creating uh, these amazing devices that battery technology is something that you're not really worrying about so much right now? I've seen tons, being that I'm in China, I see tons of amazing batteries that I want. I found the most, this thin, flexible, solid state battery that was just amazing. And I, I wanted it. it's out of Taiwan. 
But the problem that they face is they have the technology. I've even found batteries which are printed uh, with printed electronics on FPC. Amazing, incredible batteries. I want them. The problem is, is that these companies have the technology, but they don't have an order to mass produce them at a price so that I can go down to the, you know, the electronics market and buy them. This is the problem that I believe that the technology sitting in China and, and battery technology comes a lot out of Asia. Um, I've seen the most amazing, thinnest, you know, looking looking like a transparent, you know, FPC uh, battery that can charge, it can can carry enough power to light LEDs and 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 be used in smartwatches. But um, but I don't have an order quantity to be able to order from them. They need military level you know, investment uh, that can then, or, or L'Oreal level investment uh, where they would roll this out, uh, you know, as, as a light sitting under, a, a, you know, a display at a beauty counter worldwide, you know, or, or something like a Nike that would, you know, be able to use this battery technology in every single store that they have worldwide, et cetera, they need that level of orders for them to be able to sell it to me, you know, who's in the in the level of the thousands. That's really, that's a, how can we get them on board? I mean, I feel like wearables have been going round and round and round in circles, but not really going anywhere. Um, you know, I used yeah. to believe because people were not ready for it, so therefore, they didn't have a space in the market. Cause I can name so many fashion focused wearable devices that came and went. They were brilliant for a moment and then they disappeared into the abyss. So how can we get the industry to get involved? How can we get the industry to invest in all these amazing ideas? Yeah, I think that I, when I'm, I'm, I'm like, I think that like, like, you know, I think we've all come to a collective agreement as a society that like EV is the future of transportation you know like and you know i think that like a lot of the work that's being done in ev because they have the same limitations they don't have enough batteries capacity right now to make enough for the demand that it would take to replace all the gas cars in the world so like i think that like what's happening now is is that like ev companies you know like um tesla some of the european brands that have jumped into ev really hard for things like that they're they're looking at like, how can we get these batteries better? And now there's a really big rush and a really big push because the application, the application of autonomous vehicles is big enough to warrant that kind of like deep development and improvement because we've, we've reached a limitation kind of, of, of capacity, right? The same way that running out of fossil fuels caused us to invent electric vehicles in the first place, right? And so I think that as these technologies start to push forward, there are gonna be advancements and developments that drop down from EV into the wearable space. So I do feel like the battery progression is coming, it has to. Um, and I think also too, another thing is, is that like, you know, like we as, uh, you know, as, as designers, as product developers and creators, like we, a lot of times are really assigning like what, what the demand are for particular components in a marketplace. So I think that like the more that like we begin to step away from that classic super safe battery that's super cheap, you know, like because there's a billion of them that you just buy one stock and you build your product around it so that you you know it fits and you don't have to change anything. Like when we start experimenting more and pushing the envelope ourselves, manufacturers will respond. Because at the end of the day, like, remember when Apple came out with that band? Like, all of a sudden, like, you know, that band was everywhere. That wraparound loop band with the Velcro that stretches. Like, that band was everywhere. And it's all over, you know, everything right now because people had such a high demand for it. So I think really, like, you know, bringing those things into the market, I think, is much more our responsibility because we have such... We have the ability to create the products that create the demand for the components that then the manufacturers need to supply. So I think it's it's on one hand, I do think manufacturing and like making space for smaller, more boutique firms to purchase, to push 
those envelopes and technology forward, like seeing us as potential partners and use case developers to show how their technology can be successful in applications might be the better way to go instead of just looking at us as customers. But ultimately, I think that if we build the products that have the demand, like for example, Remarkable Tablet is a great example. They e-ink tablets were dying and they built this tablet that you could write with and it felt like paper. And then all of a sudden, like, you know, e-ink is 70% of their cost. So now they have a partner with, you know, the e-ink companies that make the, the screens. And, you know, those companies are doing really, really well now. So the application of the technology is what drives its usage and ultimately what drives its lowering cost at scale. Want to add anything, David? Well, yeah, there is a lot actually uh, you know, that we can explore in, uh, in, in, in all these areas. I mean, uh, going back to the battery question, really, I mean, uh, we cannot just expect or rely on uh, battery evolution. So we're looking at energy harvesting opportunities, primarily in the sports, in the sports and fitness area. You know, if you assume that the body is moving in space, <laughs> there are some clear energy harvesting opportunities there. If there is a delta temperature, right, if I'm skiing, there is a substantial temperature delta between my body and, and the external temperature that could be harvested, right? So there are multiple, multiple areas where we can, we cannot recharge, fully recharge a battery yet, but we can augment, augment uh, battery life potentially using multiple ways <laughs> to harvest energy, uh, like in the, in the two examples I, I just gave you. Um, but yeah, we, th the bottom line is, um, this is a, it, it's a daunting challenge, right? I mean, textile sensing, electronics, battery, washability, durability, privacy, all come together in this, uh, in this, uh, world of smart clothing. Um, uh, and, uh, and, you know, it becomes, uh, a multifaceted problem that can become frustrating as, <laughs> as Keith said from time to time, right? So, so, um, but it's also is also exciting because you know we are writing the book. There is no book. You cannot Google this, right? Is, you, you won't find anything. So, so that we're really writing uh, the new book on on transparent computing, which makes it super super uh, interesting. Uh, every day is, uh, is we find that you know we 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 discover something. We you know we zigzag a lot because again uh, we're definitely not going in a straight line towards uh, uh, something that is uh, you know elegant. Uh, minimalistic, very powerful, long-lasting. You know, uh, doesn't read, re doesn't need recharging. I mean, we need to take all these friction levels out of the equation to make a consumer uh, happy with the product. Because, quite frankly, you know, the consumer is becoming, you know, more and more sophisticated. So it expects long battery life. It expects uh, to to actually have a reasonable price for something that is extremely, extremely complex. Right. So. Uh, we'll get to a point where everything will be in a button, uh, in a small button, and and uh, that button be, will become the what we call the IOMe hub instead of IoT. It's really IOMe <laughs> for 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 human human data collection, and hopefully that type of button will have a very long battery life. Will will be able to communicate with multiple sensors and enable multiple scenarios. So if I'm skiing or if I'm playing golf. Uh, the data that I need is substantially different, potentially, right? So it may still be, may still be balance related, right? <laughs> if I'm skiing or playing golf, but it's completely different from what I selfish, selfishly want to see in my app, right? So, so again, uh, the sensors may be the same, the electronics may be the same, the cloud system may be the same. So why don't we just uh, reuse some of these components so we can get to scale? faster. If we, if we try to actually just do one, one single solution, one single product at a time, the cost of goods sold is just, you know, it's just too expensive, right? It's just, uh, it's just not there, right? So, but if we can actually scale and modularize some of these components across multiple scenarios, we may have a chance. See, I think the industries need to believe this is more than sci-fi. You know, they need to really believe that this is going to be the future. This is something that will benefit not only the sports industry, the medical industry, the military, but also the fashion industry. Exactly. I think once everybody can work together, then we can make it happen. I mean, if you think of the mobile phone, how that began, you know, it was in a suitcase, you know, it was expensive. Not anyone ever had a mobile phone. And then suddenly when people believed in that product and invested in it, 
not everyone, even my own mother has an iPhone. So. Yeah, I, I was at, I, I can tell you, I was at Microsoft at that, at that time. And, and the major mistake we made in that, in that industry was making the wrong assumption, which was smartphones are never going to be used by consumers. Smartphones are a business device, right? I mean, th th just a few years ago, Microsoft thought smartphones was were email machines, right? They're just uh, people were using smartphones to make calls and, and, and read email and scheduling meetings. And the assumption was they're too expensive for a consumer. And Apple, Apple, Apple decided that's not true and created a full ecosystem uh, and completely, you know, disintermediated Microsoft, which quite frankly was was ahead in in multiple ways with Windows Phone, uh, but made the wrong assumption. Uh, so again, it's 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 uh, absolutely the challenge is to build this horizontal platform that can enable the ecosystem to be built. There is no horizontal platform in smart clothing right now. Too expensive. Also, want to say that um, you know, being that I sit in China and I can, you know, we have the electronics market. Literally, you know, uh, I go to these buildings that are, you know, twenty-seven floors of vendors who are, you know, oh. factories, and and it's like going to. The shopping mall of like if you're looking for a button like there are so many buttons that I have never <laughs> seen overseas because the manufacturers are new, are terrible at communication they're 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 just not able to get their product out there they just put it there but we're able to iterate here extremely fast like you know, I go shopping for a button and then I, I go shopping for connectors. That's so much fun. But it takes me a uh, half a day of going to all these different buildings of the, the shopping mall of electronics, right? But I have to do that because if I rely on trade shows, yes, I also go to trade shows here. And there are all these, then you discover all this cool stuff. But literally, I have to go there and, and walk around for hours, you know, hours upon hours to find these new things. And so the same thing, visiting the factories, it's infamous. My team are like, don't send Anina to the factory. Because <laughs> if I go in the factory, I will see something on the floor that they think is trash. And then suddenly it becomes my illuminated chokers and I walk out, you know, Five hundred dollars later, with like a box of, of 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 prototypes, and people are like, "What are we gonna do with that?" Like in my home studio, I have like so many prototypes just because I went in a factory, and I was like, "What's that? What's that? What are you doing with that? How, what you know?" And so, like, I think in the West, you know, we don't have that opportunity, right? And that's why we see lots of smart garments. Um, even you go on Alibaba and stuff, you know, now we see so many smart garments. And I worked for five years with the central fashion government, and we did these huge exhibitions to educate the industry on fashion technology. And as a result thereof, we have fashion tech in China and so much innovation, but then they suck at getting the word out. So then then nobody finds out about it here. They don't know how to communicate. And then they don't get the orders. And it's a vicious cycle, you know? So it's like, I always highly recommend when it is possible to come on over and go shopping, you know? And the things then I cannot wait to see what Keith would come up with when he find some amazing connector button you know, new thing, what will explode in his mind, you know? So I think we need more, more communication, cross-culture and, um, and more meetings like this. I, I think what we've learned here, Muchinata, is you've opened up an enormous can of worms. We have these three <laughs> incredible innovators and engineers and designers, and we are barely touching the surface. So it, it's really amazing to talk to you. I so appreciate your time, your ideas, your sharing your thoughts, Davide, your new releases of products. Um, and I look forward very much to hearing what all of you have to say in the future as well and to share with us. Thank you so much, everybody, for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is fantastic. Anina, Keith, lovely meeting you.